Psalm 121 says this. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Psalm 123, I lift up my eyes to you, to you whose throne is in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we have endured much contempt. We have endured much ridicule from the proud, much contempt from the arrogant. Psalm 150, the very last psalm, having to do with praise. And to praise in the Hebrew word means to make bright, to recognize its greatness, his, his radiance. Praise the Lord. Praise God in this sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would bless our service now, bless my preaching. Lord, I pray that you would preach through me. Lord, I pray that I would have a tongue of a disciple, that I would sustain the weary one with the word. Lord, we bind the spirit of fear. We bind the spirit of addiction, depression, and any other hindrance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I forgot that um, we don't take our offering. We don't pass the offering plate. So at the end of the service, um, uh, if you would like to uh, give, there's two offering plates, one for our church. And then our mission of the month is uh, the voice of the Christian martyrs, which is an amazing organization, so uh, please consider uh, giving generously uh, to both. This summer we've been talking about our, our purpose in life. And just a refresher, about three or four weeks ago, um, I shared with you the discovery of the meaning of life. You may recall that uh, in the United States of America, uh, our country spends or invests about $19 billion every year on self-help, on figuring out what the meaning of life is, their purpose of life, and why they're here. And yet, we discover in the Bible that the meaning of life is to know Christ. Remember that? The meaning of life is to know Christ. Not just to know about Christ, but to know him. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying before he's arrested, he says in John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, to know, to, to gnosko, to deeply know. And then the apostle Paul, who, which one of you is Paul? There he is, Paul. All right. I, I talked to you on the phone the other day, right? Yeah, Paul. Not this Paul, but the apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know. That is the meaning of life, okay? And that is true. 
That is true no matter if we're in Brainerd, if we're in South Dakota, if we're in the Philippines, if we're in Russia, if we could go back in time and it was 1776 and we're in Philadelphia and they're signing the Declaration of Independence, the meaning of life then, as it always was and always is and always will be, is to know Christ. That is the meaning of life. Amen? Okay, then the purpose of life, which we talked about, is to glorify Christ. It is to bring Christ's glory through our lives. It is to glorify, and the word glorify in the Greek is doxa. It is to bring recognition to. It is to, to honor and, and shine brightly and point to Christ. My mission as a pastor is to point to Christ, but that is not unique to you, the follower of Christ. Your life's purpose is to glorify Christ, to bring recognition to Christ in your life. And then I said, for the rest of the summer, I want to talk about how we figure out why we're here. Because I asked for a show of hands. I said, do you know why you're here on earth? Have, has there been a moment in your life where you said, wow, this is what I was made for. It's easy to see in, 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 in things. Like I had a yellow Labrador that died last year. But she was made to retrieve. She was made to go out and, and get the ball or the pheasant or whatever's out there and bring it back. And afterwards, she would look at you like, I want to do it again. Right? That's what she was made for. It's sad because you see the, the Labradors on the leash are tied up and, and, and are, are stuck in their yards and nobody's throwing them anything. It's kind of a lack of, of, what, uh, of purpose. So when we discover why we were created then we can glorify Christ with our lives. Well, where am I going with this? Well, at 3 o'clock in the morning three nights ago, I woke up and the Lord gave me this sermon, so I'm going to do my best to remember it. I laid there for an hour, and I was like, should I get up and write this down? Should I get up and write this down? No, I'll memorize it. All right, memorize this part or memorize that part. Flip over the pillow, it's getting warm. Should I get up and write it down? I didn't write it down, but I got up the next morning and I wrote it down as best as I could. I want to talk about change and fear. Change and fear. So I'm not getting to the part yet about why you were created. However, we live in an environment, in a culture, in a moment in time where we are bombarded with fear and change. Amen? And you know what's interesting to me? Most people don't like change. Most people don't like change. You've had changes in your life. I've been praying for all of you. I walk the pews. I walk the pews and I, and I, and I think of all of you and I, and I pray for you by name and I pray for you and I pray for your families and I, and I pray for your faith in Christ and I, and I pray that, uh, that you'll grow in your love for Jesus. And then I think about you. There's people here that have been sick and healed. There's people that have had cancer and are healed. There's people that are getting cancer and aren't healed. We're, we're coming and going with these major changes in our lives. And somehow we get through. And there's two ways to get through. One is, is, is stress and fear and anxiety and, and clinging to what we think we can control when we can't control anything. And the other is to cast all of our worries and cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. He cares about you when you're up in the middle of the night, afraid and worried and sick and stewing. And how's this, how's this all going to work out? But we cast our cares upon Jesus, for he cares for you and he loves you. And he wants to be with you and he is with you and he'll never leave you. So let's talk about this. Um, I am asking for something of you. I'm asking for two things. I'm asking for you to bring a Bible every Sunday to church. I'm going to just keep doing it until we have like 100%. And the other thing I'm asking for is that you bring a pen and paper so that if you are writing down the verses that I'm mentioning or a point that I'm making or you're daydreaming and the Lord is showing you something and it's completely just between you and God, that you have that and write it down. Bring your Bible and bring a pen and paper. And I've got some out in the narthex too for you to just take. I want this to be a church where we just give and give and give Bibles so that you give them away and have enough Bibles. Uh, I want to read to you uh, the Gospel of John chapter 5, 
the Gospel of John, chapter 5, starting in verse 1. John chapter 5, verse 1. Feel free to open your phone browser if you have it. The Wi-Fi signal probably won't work. It has a password, and the Wi-Fi here is really bad because there isn't a T1 in the neighborhood. Do you have good Wi-Fi at your house, Bob? You do? Huh. The Gospel of John chapter 5. You ready? Starting in verse 1. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. And a certain man was there who had been sick 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to the man, do you wish to get well? The man answered him, sir, I have no man to, to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I was coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, arise, take up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and took up his pallet and began to walk. Absolutely incredible. 38 years, 38 years at the edge of a pool every single day, waiting for the water to be stirred up. And then as the water is stirred up, he's probably sitting there waiting for that moment from the time that the water is stirred up, from the time that he can get in so that he can be healed. And yet for 38 years, he has not been able to get into that pool and to be healed. And I think that that man probably grew accustomed to that. He grew accustomed, I presume, to being disabled and not to be able to be healed. And Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? And the man instinctively goes to the excuse, Lord, I'm here all the time, and, and they stir up the water, but nobody's here to help me get in. And so I'm not able to get healed. And Jesus heals the man. He says, arise, get up, take up your mat and walk. And the man gets up and walks and is healed. 38 years not healed. In another account, Jesus meets a man who was born blind. So he's blind his whole life. Now, I was thinking about this. Some of us go blind. Like when we're elderly. My, I didn't wear glasses. I, I was sitting in class in seminary at 40 years old and the, the words started to get just slightly shiny and just slightly blurry where I could kind of just go like this and it was okay. And then eventually it was like this and then eventually I got reading glasses. And now I'm 50 and now I have the reading glasses. So I've, I've adjusted from 2020 vision to, to a little bit of correction. And for many of us, we're born healthy, and then gradually over time, we're, we, we are sick, or we're, we're blinded, or our hearing goes, or we're somehow impacted. And so we adjust to that. But in a different way, the man was born disabled, and for 38 years, he went to the pool and then he's healed. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And then he's healed. 
And the blind man could not see for his whole life, and then all of a sudden he's able to see. And I'm wondering about that change. See, oftentimes the change that we make is the harder change. And in this case, the changes that were being made for these men actually brought them healing, brought them vision, brought them the ability to walk. What is this? Oh, I was thinking about this. See the background, that building? That's, that's where I went to seminary, back there. By the way, I didn't make, make it all the way through, I, so don't be impressed. <laughs> and that's a swing set. And that's a rock in front of that. Now, what the heck does that have to do with being healed and having faith and struggling in our lives? I'll tell you. I was, was going to ask um, for help with this, but so you see that, that boulder? That boulder is really, really big. It's like probably the size, not half the size, maybe a third of the size of a Volkswagen bug. It's big. And that boulder actually was under the ground. See, that new swing set that they put in, when they, when they leveled that dirt, they came across that giant boulder. Like, I mean, you'd probably pay a landscaping company and, and have a boulder put in. So you could sit on it and stand on it and play on it. And... But that giant boulder was under the ground. And then it was unearthed. It took a lot of effort to move that boulder. I mean, big, strong guys and a bobcat had to come and move that boulder out of the ground and put it on top of the grass. The reason as I was praying and getting this sermon in my mind, I thought of this boulder, is if you and I came upon that boulder together, we'd be like, there's no way we can move this. Right? There's no way we can move it. Let's imagine we don't have access to a bulldozer or to a bobcat. There's no way we can move it. No way. And then I was thinking about cancer. And I was thinking about cancer, how we could get cancer, and it's like a giant 5,000-pound boulder in our lives that is immovable. There's no way we can get rid of the cancer. We can't get rid of the cancer, right? And then the Lord gets rid of the cancer. There's no way that man can walk. He's been 38 years laying by the pool. There's no way. That man was born blind. There's no way that man will ever see. And then Jesus heal. Do you want to be made well? Get up and walk. And the man got up and walked. And I was thinking to myself, does that man still, after he was healed and after he could walk, could he, would he still go back to that excuse would that still run in his mind because over and over and over and over and over again for his whole life he's saying I can't walk I every time I try to get in somebody comes in and I can't get in and I I can't get healed and so over and over he's got that excuse and now we can walk you're walking what happened I don't know, this man came to me and, 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 uh, and, 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 and said, get up and take your mat and walk. And I did. And I'm healed. And I wonder, throughout his life, what it was like to make that change. See, we're used to the change of, we didn't wear masks. The whole world changed two, three months ago. If I pulled this out, it'd be like, well, are you, are you going to an operating room? When I went to see Elaine Fisk about a year ago, uh, I had to put on rubber gloves, a, a hat, a face mask, and a gown. It felt so foreign to me. I haven't been dressed like that since I watched my children being born by cesarean section, where I was literally in the room right next to my wife as she gave birth. 
with surgeons. And now this is common. Fear is paralyzing. Fear is paralyzing. Fear is paralyzing. I turn on the radio, coronavirus. I turn on the television, coronavirus. I turn on the internet, coronavirus. Church is closed. Face mask worn. There's no full protection. You might still die. Ventilators, hospital rooms. Be careful. Sanitize. Fear. Fear. And fear paralyzes people. It paralyzes our mind. It, it, it grips us and, and chokes us, strangles us. And then Jesus says, Cast all of your fear upon me, for I care for you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Perfect love drives out fear. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. Do not fear man. And then change. And then change. Ah, I think I really got it right this time, so I want to keep things as close to the same as possible. I don't like change because I get anxious and worried, and I think I can control things if I keep them slow and, and small enough that I just keep it really, really tight, and I'm going to wake up at 6, and I'm going to go to bed at 10, and in between I'm just going to hang on. That's not faith. That's the opposite of faith. That is the opposite of faith. Faith is the evidence of things unseen, those things hoped for. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God without faith. Fear. And change and, and boulders in your life. And the thing about the boulders is you're healed from cancer. Well, you lost your job and you were unemployed and you lost your house or you lost the income that you had or you lost some huge things in your life and yet here you are this morning. The Lord took care of those things. He moved those boulders aside. Right? Right? Every single person here, didn't he change, didn't he take boulders out of your life before? Didn't he move boulders? Things that seemed immovable, and now you don't even think about those things anymore because they're gone. And then it's like, ah, I stepped on a little pebble. Whoa, there's a little rock over there. I, I better stay away from the stones. And then for a short time, you come to church. And then hopefully I'm saying, Jesus, Jesus did that for you. And Jesus is doing things for you right now. And Jesus will continue to do things for you. It might not always be comfortable. You might still get sick. You might still die. But Jesus will never leave you. And he's calling you to change, by the way. The whole world changed. The whole world changed. The, the world will never be the same. It will never be the same. In May of 2020, the world changed. It will never be the same. The United States will never be the same. I have people that are, that are friends of mine that, that are Republicans that are clinging to things in the political realm. I have friends that are Democrats that are clinging to the things in the political realm. The world's never going to be the same. The country's never going to be the same. I'm sad to say it. I, I hope I'm wrong. I'm not. I do believe that churches are going to close like you've never seen before in the United States over the next 18 to 24 months. You're going to see a band of churches. If our giving doesn't go up, we might be having that conversation in a year. I don't know. It's time to be serious about following Christ. We got to kind of flirt with being serious about following Christ. 
it's over. Being kind of, well, I've got my tiptoe in, in Christ and, and 99% of my life over here because I really like the world, and I'll be honest, the world has been really comfortable and easy in the 20th century in the first two decades of the 21st century in the United States, relatively. It hasn't cost us anything to follow Christ. We have to change. And we can't be afraid. So what do you do when you're afraid? Because let's be honest, we're going to be afraid. It's going to happen. There's no sermon. There's no antidote. There's no self-help book. There's not even a Bible verse, even though Karen, you and I know Philippians chapter 4. I've heard you say it. You know it by heart. I know it by heart. I've clung to those verses. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen? We know those verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We know those verses. Those verses help us. I've been up in the middle of the night praying those verses, reciting and repeating those verses, and I still get afraid. And then I have a friend call me, and we pray, and then I'm not afraid. And then I call another friend, and I say, don't be afraid. We need each other because by ourselves, we are afraid. By ourselves, it's like plucking a brand from the fire. If we have a campfire someday out here and we pull a branch out of the, uh, the campfire, it eventually goes out. And that's how I am. And that's how all of you are. We can't follow Christ alone. We need each other. And pray that Menawasha Church becomes that kind of bonfire that lights up this community and lights you up to glorify Christ and embrace the change and don't be afraid. Amen.